Heavenly Father, we thank you that um, all of your word is God-breathed and is useful. We pray now as we study this chapter, as we finish off this book of Ezra, uh, Heavenly Father, that uh, we would see in these words uh, your goodness, your kindness, your grace, and your mercy. We pray that we would see uh, in these words how much we need Jesus and that you would bring us to yourself through him by your word this morning. Amen. So Ezra uh, 10, we're finishing off our series as I just prayed in uh, this this great book uh, detailing the beginnings of uh, Israel's return to Jerusalem after their exile at the hands of uh, the Babylonians and uh, through the judgment of God. Uh, And as we we come to this uh, passage uh, this morning, I think there are just a a few things we need to get uh, right in, in our minds. Uh, otherwise, there's a great danger that we that we read words like these and we go away confused or angry, or, or that we totally misapply them and get ourselves into all sorts of uh, all sorts of mess. So let me just deal with a few things before we sort of uh, go headlong into to this chapter. Firstly, we need to remember, as we come to uh, Ezra 10, that there is a context to Ezra 10. Ezra's job. Chapter 7, verses 23 to 26, was to ensure that the returning exiles were living in accordance to God's law because it was good for them. So you'll remember back to uh, verse 26 of chapter 7, King Artaxerxes, who was sending Ezra to Jerusalem, back to Jerusalem, said to him, whoever will not obey the law of your God and the law of the king, let judgment be strictly executed on him, whether for death or for banishment or for confiscation of his goods or for imprisonment. Uh, The whole point of Ezra's return was to bring about spiritual renewal and call God's people back to God's word. You see, the very reason, and we need to remember this, the very reason that the Israelites had ended up as slaves in Babylon in the first place was because they, under the rule of a series of bad kings, had begun to live lives that were totally at odds with God's laws. God had told them that as as his people, they were to live lives that reflected him and his values and his ways. They were to be holy, set apart like he is holy. And yet what they started to do was to try and blend in with the world around them. They started adopting the world's gods, the world's values, the world's ways. So much so, they began, just as we find here in this passage, to intermarry and so dilute their allegiance to gods as they adopted the religions and the customs and the ways of their spouses from the nations around them. Uh, The issue, as we'll see in a few moments, wasn't that they were marrying foreigners but that in marrying foreigners, they were buying into foreign false religion. The issue, as John explained to us last week, and listen to his sermon, uh, because he goes into it in a bit more detail, is, is spiritual and not racial. Which is why there are examples of marriages to foreigners in the Old Testament that were seen as okay, because the person marrying into Israel did so as a worshipper of God. We've got to remember the issue is one of spiritual faithfulness and not racial prejudice. God had chosen Israel. He had been faithful to Israel. He had provided for Israel. He had protected them, led them and loved them. It it was, it is good to be one of God's people. And yet the whole context of this chapter is that back in the book of 2 Chronicles, just before this book in our Bible, uh, God's people essentially stuck two fingers up at God. And and rather than listen to him say, look, God, we can manage without you, thanks very much. We can utilize these other gods from these other nations around us. We can enjoy their customs. We don't need to rely just on you. And so God, after many, many warnings, as he sent his prophets to call the people back to himself and his ways, eventually said, look, that's fine. Have it your way. Let's see how life without me goes for you as he hands them over to Babylon and he allowed them to be carried off into exile and slavery for 70 years. He did so in order to teach them to to walk with him and not against him. So that they might see that life with him as his people is so much better, so much freer, so much more fulfilling 
than life without him. That false gods don't work and that it is good, so good to have God with you as you walk through life. Christian, please don't forget, we mustn't forget, it is good. It is good to be God's people living in God's ways. And so now as we jump forward from Chronicles to chapter 7 of Ezra, Ezra is sent to the returned exiles now back in Jerusalem in order to ensure that they learn from their past and walk in God's ways into the future. So that they might experience his blessing, which is why in our passage when in verse 2, Shechaniah realises that God's people are breaking God's law in terms of their marriages, and so have verse 2, broken faith with our gods, As he sees that it's like Groundhog Day all over again, that they've started to do exactly the same thing that led them into exile in the first place. Well, look what Shechaniah tells Ezra in verse 4. Ezra, this this is exactly what you were sent for. Your job, Ezra, is to call us to spiritual purity, to holiness, to faithful, single-minded relationship with God. It is good for us to be his people, living in his ways. We don't want to be cut off again from God's presence and blessing. So Ezra, verse 4, arise. For it is your task, and we are with you. Be strong and do it. Sort us out, Ezra, so that we don't end up as slaves all over again. And just notice, just as a a side point here, that Shechaniah recognizes that in calling people to live God-honoring, obedient lives is no easy task. It can be scary, and it can be intimidating. He has to give Ezra a little bit of a pep talk here, doesn't he? Ezra, be strong and do it. Come on, Ezra, put on your courage pants. You can do it. Can I just say, as a side, just don't despise the Christian woman or man who points out sin in your life and calls you back to following Jesus. It is a courageous person who does that. Now, hopefully, they'll do it graciously and sensitively and wisely, that like we see in verses 16 and 17 of our passage, they'll take time to work some of the stuff out with you and not simply condemn you, and that'd be that. But it takes courage to call sin, sin. So don't despise the faithful men and women in your life who want to help you to walk faithfully in the ways of God. Because, and I'll say it again, what we're talking about here in this chapter isn't marriage, but holiness God wants his people's faithfulness and with that their obedience he wants them in their lives to reflect his goodness and grace and purity and love the new testament tells us that the church you me we are a city on the hill shining out God's goodness for all to see And so a church that looks like the world as it adopts the world's ways and practices and God's is failing in its mission. But of course for Israel, the presenting issue, the issue behind the issue is one of marriage. Now a couple of things on this. Firstly, it is so easy to look at Ezra or God in this passage with anger or suspicion. Like how dare they call for the end of a marriage? It's pretty stark words in this passage isn't it but please we must be careful not to direct our anger at the wrong players here this is all on Israel and not on God you see Israel have just been brought home from exile and exile remember that was because of their unfaithfulness to God and so they knew that God wanted faithful obedience And you see that in verses 2 and verses 6 and verses 10, don't you, as it talks about we have broken faithfulness. And Israel knew because they had it, they knew that God's law in Deuteronomy chapter 7 says, you shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. And so as we read the verdict here and we feel the shock of them having to Break up with their spouses. What is it? it says? Put them away. We need to know that the consequences really are all on them. God hasn't changed. He hasn't changed the benchmark here. They've ignored him and so they must bear the responsibility. Here's the problem. Sin is messy. 
and repentance, trying to unpick the mess of our sinful decisions, will be messy and will be hard. And I think also slow. We must be patient. It's interesting to note that in verses 14 to 17, it took three months for each of the cases to be heard and judged. It'll take time to make things right. But to blame God or those who call us to repentance when we're found in sin, to shake our fist at him and say, hey God, I did this sinful thing and now it hurts me and others to put it right, how dare you, is not repentance, it's scapegoating. However hard it was, however harsh the remedy, the people here as they stood, verse 12 and 13, in the pouring rain, cold and miserable, understood that faithfulness to God was the means to blessing. And so instead of waving their fists at God, they were willing to do what was right and not what was easy to fix things. Now, it's worth saying, too, that whilst it's not explicitly said about what happened to the wives and children culturally, it is very likely that they were taken care of as they went home to their family units. It's unlikely they were just kicked out of the house and sort of abandoned. All that to say, it may not have been as cold and harsh as the first reading here. We just, we just don't know. And then just to deal with the elephant in the room, the final thing to say before we spend the rest of our time thinking through the applications of this passage for us is this. The application of this passage is not go and divorce your non-Christian spouse. Uh, the New Testament would still say it's unwise to marry someone who isn't a Christian because trying to work out life with them and remain faithful to Jesus, your marriage pulls in two different directions, is going to be really hard. But nevertheless, 1 Corinthians 7 does allow room for such marriages. So if that's you this morning, relax. No one's going to tell you you need to get divorced and will condemn you for your marriage. So, so what do we learn from this passage? Well, firstly, we learn that faithfulness to God matters. Faithfulness to God matters. I've already said a number of times, I want it to be clear, and John said it last week, the issue behind the issue here is faithfulness. The reason that God is bothered about this intermarrying isn't racial, it is spiritual. God wants his people's allegiance over and above all other gods. He wants his people to be holy, set apart, different from the world around them, because holy lives reflect who he is and brings him glory. And God knows that Christian living is what's best for us. He doesn't want spiritual adulterers. Christian, God wants you to trust him on how you walk as you walk through this life into the next. But we live in a world that tells us to hedge our bets, right? Oh, sure, you can have your God, but maybe... Maybe have some others too, just come and worship at the temple of career because career will bring you identity and it'll bring you respect and it'll bring you money and it'll bring you status and you'll be blessed if you worship at the temple of career. Or, or have your Christianity, but add to it the God of leisure because in leisure you can experience heaven now as you holiday in the best that this world has to offer. You can escape for 90 minutes as you yell at 22 men in a field or as you lose yourself in a show. You can self-medicate with alcohol and with drugs. You can buy yourself blessing. You can experience all these blessings now, however temporary, before you find yourself longing for more. And the point of this passage is that God is not a God who's going to share you with others. Because he's made you. And he loves you. And he's remained faithful to his promises for you, culminating in sending Jesus to die for you in order to lead you into heaven with him. God knows that being his people is good for you. So he doesn't want you to turn your head. And here in Ezra 10, the start of this great act of spiritual renewal is the people recognizing that they have been unfaithful to God. Verse 2, we have broken faith with our God. Verse 10, Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, you have broken faith. And verse 12, then all the assembly answered with a loud voice, it is so, yes we have. We see it now. Crush your stop, where, where this morning do we maybe need to acknowledge with 
sorrow and with grief. The same levels of sorrow and grief that Ezra displays in verse 1 and 6, both in public and in private, that we have turned our heads from God and what God calls us to, to pursue, in fact, to wed ourselves to the values, the gods, the identity of the world around us. Does your life as a Christian look any different to the life of your non-Christian neighbour? Other than the fact you come here on a Sunday morning and maybe go to growth team. Or have we just, and I say we, have we just assimilated to the values and the culture that we live in? At Peter, one of Jesus' disciples and one of the New Testament writers says this of the church, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Sin, living life in rejection of your maker's ways and values and purposes and plans is no small thing. It should cause in us deep anguish as we recognize it in our lives. Because look at verse 14, look what it leads to. It leads to the fierce wrath of God. Sin brings about exile, it bring, leads to being cut off from our maker, it brings us under judgment and not blessing Faithfulness matters. So what must we do when we discover sin? We'll look at verse 11. Ezra gives us the answer. Make confession to the Lord, the God of your fathers, and do his will. Confess and obey. Christian, we, we come before God in the acknowledgement of our sin and we say sorry. We say this week after week, don't we, at Christ Church Stop Up, but, but listen to the words of another New Testament writer, John. He says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And each week we come before God in corporate confession, right? But do you see why? It's because we as a church want to be a church that is living in God's ways and quick to acknowledge and say sorry and to put it right when we are not and then to throw ourselves as we'll come to in a little bit on the mercy of the Lord Jesus who makes it possible for God to forgive us. But here's the thing, the prayer we pray every Sunday is only the beginning. Because look at verse 11 again. There's more than just confessing, isn't there, in verse 11? No, no, Christian, as you see yourself as a sinner in need of God's grace and forgiveness, you must also strive in the power of the Holy Spirit to obey, to do his will. You see, whenever, whenever God rescues his people in the Old Testament, he then calls them to obedience. So that the Ten Commandments came after God rescued his people from Egypt back in the book of Exodus. Ezra comes now after the exile, the return back to Jerusalem from Babylon. Obedience is the proper response to rescue. And look what obedience means for Israel here. Separate yourselves from the people of the land and from foreign wives. Deal with the sin. However painful that process might be, however costly, however much it might hurt your pride, your social life, your income, your reputation, your wants and desires, and however long it might take to unpick stuff, 
If you are a Christian here today, you are called to be holy for the Lord your God is holy. You are a city on a hill, right? See, do you start to see that sin isn't this trivial thing? It's not some little transgression that lands us on the naughty step. It is a threat to your relationship with the living God. Which is why Jesus himself says, and please, he's talking metaphorically, but making a massive point. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than for your whole body to go to hell. Where do you need to start getting ruthless with sin in your life? The places you go, people you hang out with, stuff you watch, li read, listen to, sins of your heart, pride, arrogance, lies, covetousness what are the areas to look till now perhaps have been off limits to God what are the strongholds of worldliness and idolatry that you're holding on to with an iron fist maybe and you have to trust them to do this maybe ask someone who knows you well what they see in your life And then remember verse 4 to treat them kindly because pointing out sin in others' lives is, well, it's a scary endeavour. Sin, friends, is serious. It needs to be put to death seriously. And look, this confession and this obedience, it wasn't simply a private matter, was it? It was a corporate one. You see, verse 9, the people's sin affected the whole community. In fact, out of tens of thousands of people who were, were back, uh, returned from, from, from exile, actually there's only 110 mentioned in that list right at the end of the passage that we didn't have read. But, but that little amount of sin affects the, the whole community. That's why we confess our sins privately and it's why we confess our sins corporately. But it also meant that the remedy of cutting sin out was a corporate responsibility. So let us help one another to kindly, graciously, and patiently do battle in your sin in, sin in your life. I, I know I need you to help and point it out in me and to hold me accountable. Help me to go to battle with sin. Because we're on this journey to eternity together. Friends, this passage, this book tells us time and time again that spiritual purity, proper worship, relationship with God matters. That we are to shine brightly to a dark world and show them how good it is to have God as our God. It asks you to ask yourself, where is there sin that needs dealing with as I walk to heaven? It asks you to ask yourself, where might I not be living with God as God? It asks you to ask yourself, where have I assimilated to the world around me? But, but finally, I think it asks you to ask yourself, where is your true and real hope? Where is your true and real hope? Because here's the thing. We got to the end of the book of Ezra. And it kind of, like Ezra and Nehemiah are two books that go together. So I recognize that in the Old Testament, that, like the, the, the Jews would have read these books together. And so we're kind of in the middle of a book here. But, but nevertheless, these, these sort of acts of Ezra, they, they just sort of come to this end with this list of names of people who have been in sin. And I think that's in contrast, you know, God's people are honored publicly at the beginning of the book. And then they are called out publicly at the end of the book because we're on this corporate journey together but but it kind of just dwindles out right i mean think about it we did start didn't we at the book of ezra on this massive high so god's people had been exiled because of their unfaithfulness to god because of the faithfulness of god now 
are returned and he promises to build a people who will worship him forever so they're restored to Israel. They're sent home to rebuild the temple and start out life once more as the set apart people of God and everything's like looking really rosy after the exodus and we're all really excited because here's the fresh beginnings, new beginnings, sent home to rebuild the temple, start out life once more. We had such high hopes at the beginning of the book. Do you remember the celebrations in, in chapter 3 as the foundations of the temple were finished and everything was looking great? And yet here, by the end of the book, we're just seeing history repeating itself all over again. These rescued people of God are falling back into sin, back into idolatry, ignoring God and his word all over again. Oh, sure, they, they, they repent and they seek to make things right. But we know, right, from first-hand experience how this pattern of sin just rumbles on in the background. We know from first-hand experience we, we cut it off and then it just rears its ugly head again. And so Ezra right, leaves us with a question, which is this. Can, can we ever have any assurance that God won't one day run out of patience with us and banish us from his presence? that you won't one day just send us into exile. Because that's what we deserve. How do we know we won't one day find ourselves cut off from God for our sin and left in the hand of a megalomaniac king of Babylon? And the answer? Well, his name's Jesus. His name's Jesus. You see, we live... The other side of Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection. And we know that when Jesus died, what happened? As he was buried, he was cut off from God in our place. So that we who trust in him need not be. He, at the cross, took our exile. Do you remember what it was that he cried from the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you stopped looking at me? Why have you cut me off? Where are you, God? And God's answer is, so that I need not forsake those who come after you and follow you. So I need not forsake those who identify with you, who put their trust in you, who believe that you died for them. You see, the identity of God's people is wrapped up in whether or not they trust Jesus. Whether they will wed themselves, not to false gods, false hopes, false promises, but to him. Trusting that he died in their place for their sin. So that as they run to him in heartfelt confession, they do so knowing that they will always get a gracious welcome and forgiveness. And so that they could be assured of God's presence forever. And we get that presence now in the work of the Holy Spirit who helps us to live out God's word with obedience and joy until that day when we arrive in heaven and spend all eternity without sin and under the blessing of God. That's where our assurance is. Ezra, you see, the whole book points us forward to a better way. A way that means we never need fear being cut off from God as his people. Because of the Lord Jesus who will one day lead us through this life and into God's perfect presence forever. So we can come to him in confession knowing that we'll be forgiven. That we'll be restored. That it is not the end. If there is sin in your life, confess, obey, return to the Lord and rejoice that he says, welcome home. Welcome back. Let me give you that hug of welcome. And until then, in the assurance of our salvation, until we get to eternity, we must live out lives that shine the very grace and mercy of God to the ends of the earth. We must shine this out to a lost and broken world. Lives that declare to all around that it is very good to have God as our God. A God of grace and mercy and welcome. As we do battle with sin and seeking all things to follow him in this world. Let's pray.
Why don't you take a moment in your, the quietness of your own hearts and minds to reflect on where you need to bring before God a confession where perhaps this week you need to go and do some business with sin. Where perhaps you haven't been living those lives of obedience. Perhaps you just want to quietly reflect and think through how great it is to have God as our God, a God of welcome and forgiveness. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are holy, that your character is one of grace and mercy and compassion and love. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we, as your people, know that living as you have us, as you call us to live, is good for us. And yet, Father, we also know that we are so pulled in so many directions that often we forget that, lose sight of that, reject that, and fail in that. And so we ask that you would forgive us. Forgive us where there is sin in our lives. Father, we ask, too, that you would help us as we leave this place this morning and know that there are changes that we need to make that there are things in our lives that we need to cut off and deal with. We ask that as we unpick the difficulty, or, uh, difficulty of doing that, that you would help us, that you would strengthen us, that you would give us courage. Our Father, we thank you that in the Lord Jesus we have assurance. We thank you that even as we pray now, as we say sorry for our sin, that we can pray knowing that because of him, because he was cut off uh, in our place, that we can run to you and know that you'll hear us, that you'll accept us, that you won't cut us off, but that you'll welcome us back. Help us not to be a despairing people as we consider our hearts and our sin, but to be a people who rejoice in the work of the Lord Jesus. Amen.